Good Thursday morning. We're still in, believe it or not, we're still in St. Mark's first chapter, about five lines each. It's so, because it's a, a string of miracles, okay? But it's bigger than that. Said a leper came to him and kneeling down, begged him and said, if you wish, you can make me clean. Move with pity, stretch out his hand, touched the leper, and he said to him, I do will it be made clean. The leprosy left him immediately. He was made clean. And warning him, he sternly said, dismissed him at once. Then he said to him, see that you tell no one anything, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses prescribed. That will be proof for them. The man went away and began to publicize the whole matter spread the, the report abroad so that it was impossible for Jesus to enter any town openly. He reigned outside in a deserted place, and people kept coming to him from everywhere. So it's a neat story. You know, they, there is a theory in the interpretation, at least in my going back 50 years, it was called the Messianic, Messiah Geheimnis in German, the Messianic secret. They couldn't understand how he could be pulling off all these miracles, and at the same time, people doubted him. What happened afterwards? And they said, well, he, he kept it quiet. He told them, don't go tell anybody. They're trying to feed the gospel writers in the early preaching, trying to figure out, how could you pull these miracles off and, and, and nobody knows about it? Well, he, he told them not to say anything. You know, go home, don't, don't say nothing. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. I think that's part of the messianic secret, the Messiah Geheimnis in German. Anyway, but I was thinking about what I said yesterday about the faith, you know, and... Oh, I just, I'm so conscious of the people who impacted my life and how the faith was handed on to me and how I hope I hand it on to others. And I, I thought of, I told this story so many times, how, so this is again my Italian aid culture, how a couple of pals, I saw the faith exercised, exercised, not exercised, exercised, among friends. They were two guys, friends their entire life. One was a daily communicant. I told you this story, I know I have. The other guy, the only time he knew, he knew what time mass was because that's when his wife would come home with the donuts. <laughs> you had to know. And they were what we would call not friends. You got to come from a neighborhood for this. They were pals. Pals is far greater than friendship. It's a love between men, could be women, women could be pals to each other, in which the differences are irrelevant. There's a sense in which there is a bond that transcends all explanation, your pals. There was a, there was a play on Broadway, Pal Joey. You gotta know that. I think my friend Al and I, and also, no, more Frankie and I than Al, Al and I are very, very close friends. But I would describe Frank as a pal. As a pal, you yeah. know. It's hard to explain it. But you know it when you have a pal. You know you have a pal. And I think that, you know, that seems to me to be pals look out for each other, you see. And I remember these two guys they were pals, and they were as different as you could get, as I just described it. But they were both, when I got to, I knew one for years and years. He was a member of the parish. And um, I was close to him, I had a lot of respect for him. He was a paisan. And he was a beautiful man, a beautiful man of faith, had a beautiful family, beautiful wife. I mean, you just had a nose of family of faith and beauty. And uh, he, when he was dying, I went to see him every day and I anointed him, brought him communion every day. And he told me about his, I learned this story because he had a pal, literally, on the hill section of, of St. Louis. And they would always bum around together. Well, they went to the casinos together. They were, they were pals. But as each of them got sicker and sicker, they both had cancer. They couldn't do as much. And finally, they, could, they couldn't they could meet. All they could do was talk on the phone. And then all they could do, they were so, so sick, is they could just say the Our Father. That's the truth, they'd say it on the phone. 
and both names were Joe. Joe, just, hey, Joe, Joe, our father. And I was following this narrative all along. And I told the star, Joe, the Joe I knew the best died first. But he told me about this pal of his, Joe, from the hill. Well, I said this in the homily about the Our Father. Well, in an Italian aid culture, you have to understand that kind of conversation spreads like wildfire. Within two hours of the funeral, for first Joe, second Joe got a hold of me. And I took care of him until he died. And I brought him to sacraments, to Eucharist every day. He was redeemed by his friend. One pal redeemed the other simply by saying the Our Father and sharing it with me, a mere instrument of the church. But through my friendship with the first Joe, I became a true friend of the second Joe. That's how it works. Pals, looking out for pals. I mean that too. Pals look out for pals. And out of the suffering, their mutual suffering, but the love they had for each other, one Joe redeemed the other Joe. That's friendship. That's being a pal. And I was just a mere instrument of it. That was a long, long time ago. But I remember it so vividly. So vividly. Because that's how grace works. And you see it at the end here. The gospel said, okay, the, the, the leper spread the word, you see? Spread the word. When you're graced, you can't help but spread the word. And first Joe was spreading the word through me. See? Through me. He made sure his pal received the sacraments. He made sure of it. He made sure in his own way of having me connected to his pal on the hill. See? That's the truth. Did he have it all thought out? No. But he brought me into his conversation by telling me the story of their conversation and the Our Father. That's poignant. Friends together, pals together, not even friends, but we're pals together. One a very saintly man, the other not so. But in the end, one redeemed the other. And the third party was me, used in the best sense of the word, to help redeem one and then in turn been redeemed myself. Because as I was an instrument of grace to them, they're an instrument of grace to me. I discovered that the power of redemption, not by preaching or theology, but by example of these two pals. Oh, why would I even bother to bring it up right now? I guess because I see it. We redeem each other. Not only by our example, we do that, but by our love we have for each other. The way we are pals with each other, we bring life, and beauty, hope, and trust by being pals. Frankie was my pal. I made sure he was anointed. He's in paradise. I looked out for Frankie but Frankie would have done it for me. Hands down, you gotta know that. Pals look out for pals. It's just a true story. Just a true story. <laughs> I love that kind of stuff, you know that? You can keep all the piety you want. When I think of holiness, I think of pals looking out for pals. They bring the grace of the gospel, not by their words, but by the way they live with each other, pals together. <laughs>